There we go. Three, two, one. Well, Laura, um, welcome to work, I guess. <laughs> uh, welcome uh, to here. Well, we call it Mayor's Monday. You're not exactly a mayor. You're not elected. Um, yeah. You're the mayor of health, though, for us here <laughs> in Marathon County. So we're going to go with that here at WSAU, WSAU.com. First off, uh, not a lot of people probably knew who you were in Marathon County before all this started. Mm -hmm. um, and then Joan, of course, stepped aside as the health officer. You were appointed just about a month ago now. Give yes. us an idea of who you are. Oh, okay. Um, well, I have been in Marathon County. Uh, and so before this, I was, uh, before I became the health officer, um, I worked uh, at the health department here as a, a patient educator, but before that, I actually was an executive over at North Central Healthcare for four years, and prior to that, I ran Bridge Community Health Clinic for eight years. So, you know, I've been involved in the community um, in, in circles involving, like, nonprofits and the underserved. Like, I've been involved in that. So then, uh, how do you go from that to becoming um, health officer? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, my background is I have a master's of public health. Um, and so uh, I am, I've done a lot of like nonprofit management in my past. And so um, you, in order to be a health officer, of, uh, there's very specific guidelines in, in, the, in the administrative code about who can become a health officer. And according to our level of health department, you have to have a master's of public health and a certain number of years of experience, which I thankfully had. So mm -hmm. that's and how you get to be it. <laughs> yeah, because you, you were able to, if from what Lance said, it was a national search and mm -hmm. you obviously been, they didn't have to go very far to find you because you were here anyway. So it wasn't uh, something that this was just a, a line of succession that this was handed down to you. There was a, a search process for this. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then give us an idea of what uh, your role has been with the county then as we've gone through what's obviously been a very important time <laughs> for public health with COVID-19 um, settling in. We'd like to think that the pandemic's over, depending on who you talk to, some people think it is over. Mm -hmm. It's not. And it uh, probably won't be for uh, for some time yet. Yeah, I, I'm glad you bring that up. So um, it's funny, I, actually, I started with the health department about two weeks before the pandemic hit. And so um, uh, I actually just started and then uh, the pandemic hit and I had to completely, you know, figure out, you know, how to support the county in a whole different way than what I was anticipating. Um, so I, I uh, helped with um, testing coordination. So uh, we did a lot of events with the National Guard and then I helped with um, vaccine strategy. Um, and then at some point I actually got promoted to the community health improvement director position because uh, the previous, my predecessor, Judy Burroughs, retired. Um, and then I was in that position for four months before uh, the health officer position became available. So, uh, you know, I was one of the few people and people have said like, what kind of person takes on a health officer role during a pandemic? And I can, I could just say like, it's, um, you have to love public health and you have to love what you do in order to really um, get beyond the fact that we're in such a crisis. And uh, to your point there, the, uh, the pandemic's still here. It's still going on. Um, the difference is, uh, there are some differences between this year, this time uh, last year and now. Uh, we have the Delta variant now, we have the vaccine now. Um, Delta variant's about two times more uh, virulent than the, last, than the previous uh, COVID-19. So a lot of um, interesting complications are happening, but uh, we're still saying the same things to people. Wash your hands, social distance, stay home when sick, quarantine, uh, you know, if you're a close contact, stay home, mm -hmm. <laughs> isolate if you have COVID-19, you know, all the same stuff that people have heard so many times. Yeah, and for some people like me, obviously isolating is is not that big of a deal. I've, I have my cat in my house, that's where I like to be. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, obviously, it hasn't been that easy and, and that's obviously led to a lot of, uh, you know, the politicism, politicism politicalization mm -hmm. of the of the pandemic how yeah. easy, uh, how has it been to, to navigate that and make sure that uh, you're remaining vigilant while still taking you know everybody's um, feelings or viewpoints into consideration I find what really helps and, and I've said this before because uh, Katie Rosenberger the mayor and I have a weekly um, it's not a podcast it's like a video cast that we do on Facebook every week and mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about this before about um, how do we 
broach this subject with people that may not agree with us. And, uh, and the, um, the secret, the secret sauce to making it happen is to listen with empathy. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I'm talking with people who are adamantly anti-vaccination or adamantly anti-mask, um, there's stuff to unpack there. Like, uh, you have to sit down with them and talk with them like, okay, tell me more about this. Tell me more about what your fears are. Where did you get this information? Um, because if we're listening, then it's more likely that we're going to understand them so that we can um, have a dialogue rather than just fight against each other the whole time. I think that that's probably the most difficult part of my job in the media, anybody's job in the media, anybody like you as well that has been dealing with this is finding a way to say, I'm not going to fight fire with fire mm -hmm. in this situation. We are going to get down to the bottom of this and, and where this, where your understanding comes from. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's, it's great to hear that from somebody <laughs> in a position like this, because uh, again, it's people like you that will guide us through pandemics like this and help us come out at the other end better than we were before, which I'm guessing is probably one of the biggest challenges of your job right now. Yeah, I want to get us to the other side. So that that is one of the things. My main goal is like, let's get us to the other side. Let's have um, as many um, people stay healthy as we possibly can. You know, some of the things about COVID that I, I don't think a lot of people are talking about yet is it's it's really a new virus. We don't know. Uh, we don't have like longitudinal studies. We don't know in the long term how this virus is going to impact somebody who has gotten it. And we're already seeing some people who are, you know, COVID long haulers or COVID, you know, they have symptoms even after they've um, cleared the disease. And so is this going to create chronic conditions? You know, what is this going to look like in kids if they get it um, and they uh, have like this long haul symptoms? Um, is it going to be like a chronic disease that we all have to live with? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, with all that in mind, and as you mentioned, the way that the Delta variant is more transmissible, transmissible has been, you know, well reported. And then we also have some other variants still that are kind of bubbling under the surface right now. Yeah. I, it, is, is there going to be a point here this winter where you may see a need for other preventive measures, maybe another masking resolution, a masking mandate for the county, things mm -hmm. like that? You know, I hope we don't have to get there. I, I think that the numbers are concerning right now, and uh, we're we're not keeping up with the number of people at the health department. We're in what's called a um, crisis standards of care when it comes to uh, calling people that have been close contacts. And, and we've actually, uh, it, the numbers got so high that uh, we've been asking positive cases to call their own close contacts uh, because we weren't able. And just to give you a sense of it, I, you know, I've been telling this to people, I, mm -hmm. I said this to the uh, uh, WASA board, uh, school board the other night, um, to kind of help people understand what kinds of numbers we're dealing with. Like we get, you know, uh, the last couple of days we've been getting around 80 cases in a day. And then, um, and then to add on to that, each person uh, is not, quarantining or staying home like they were this time last year. And so it could be 10 people that they were close contacts. It could be 50 or more. And sometimes it's 50 or more. And so we can be calling up to, like, if we had enough people, we would be calling up to 4,000 people in a day. Um, that's just not sustainable and it doesn't account for all the growth also. So mm -hmm. maybe it's 80 now, but tomorrow, what is it going to be? Yeah, indeed. So it will, is there going to be a point where, where that will have to be considered then in the near future? A masking mandate? Yes. You know, I think it's, it's one of the mitigation measures that has been scientifically proven is, you know, we, I have, I, I've done the research, I've looked at it and uh, DHS and uh, CDC, DPI, like a lot of different um, uh, scientific organizations have said, you know, this actually makes a difference. Um, I think that because of the political nature of masking right now, it's going to be a very difficult discussion mm -hmm. <laughs> if that Obviously. is yes. what is needed. Um, so what I'm hoping for is that um, people understand and uh, and get vaccinated. It, you know, they'll seek out vaccination because I really see that as being one of the ways that we get out of this is if we all understand and, and uh, talk to your doctor about getting vaccinated. Um, and then the hope is, They'll get vaccinated. And also, if you do it right now, you get a hundred bucks from the state <laughs> until September 30th. So like that, that's my hope is that enough people will um, get vaccinated so that we we have a way out. There is like a, an exit ramp for us. So then speaking about vac vaccinations, it seems like uh, at this point, 
it, you would almost think anybody who's going to get it right now has has gotten it, but we are still seeing the numbers tick up. While they may not be ticking up mm -hmm. as fast as you or I would like to see them, there are still hundreds of people every day that are getting their first shots. Yeah. Uh, how can people get access to those vaccines yet here uh, in the county? And in case, mm -hmm. again, as we like to say, they've been living under a rock here lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and that's interesting because I I've, uh, I'm personally very interested in the, the um, decision-making process that a person goes through to make decisions about their health. And so um, I've, I've looked at some studies about, you know, how people go about that. And, they, you know, there may be people out there that, um, that we're waiting to see, get, see if there's FDA approval. And there was, there is now. Um, and so there, there might be people who are holding out that, you know, they, they want more research. They want more anecdotal stories from their friends and family. So there are people out there that have yet to get vaccinated. They just need to go to vaccines.gov and then they can put in, um, you know, a, a zip code and it will show them within a 50 mile radius of, of all the different places that they can get vaccinated. And they can even choose which vaccine they want. Um, so if you want specifically only to get one shot, you put in the Johnson & Johnson shot. You can find places within your geographic region that you can get it at. And I know there's a lot of uh, confusion about uh, this as well. The Pfizer vaccine, there was a name change on it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, what, can you, what do you know about that? Because from what I understand, it's still the same vaccine. It's the same formula. They, it's, it's not the new Coke. They haven't <laughs> changed the formula on it. Yep. There was, it's just a name change that's basically cosmetic. Is that correct? That's correct. So the formula, the formula has not changed. It's, um, the name has changed. They're calling it community, or I'm, I might not be even saying it wrong. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's the Pfizer vaccine. It's the, it's the same vaccine. It has the same things in it. Um, and, you know, I, I actually went over with Katie exactly what was in the vaccine one time, uh, bored her to death, I'm sure. Uh, but but all, all the stuff that's in it is, you know, there's the mRNA and there's some um, stabilizers to, and then there's some sugars in it. And that's basically what the, what's in the vaccine. Uh, and that stuff is published everywhere. So people can take a look at exactly what would be in it. So what kind of sugars are we talking about? Is this any different than the Mountain Dew I drink every day or? How do you take this Mountain Dew? <laughs> yes, it's different. Okay, okay, just checking. Right, right. So it's not the same there, but yes, the, yep. the research is there. You're telling me I can go and, and do that uh, on, on my free time when I'm not playing Fortnite. Sure, well, yeah, okay. if, you, yeah. if the, you're so inclined. Fortnite is more fun. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. absolutely. One more thing then before we let you go. It doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with COVID-19. Actually, it kind of does. It's a different strain of, uh, of virus, of mm -hmm. flu, but the flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, I know there's actually a push for people to, to try and get themselves vaccinated before Halloween because mm -hmm. I know that's going to be very important this winter as well because... Uh, we aren't going to have the mitigation strategies in place that helped keep us from having mm -hmm. a slow flu season last year, uh, which is going to be an extra strain on the health system or potentially yeah. an extra strain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, we are encouraging people to get their flu vaccine. In fact, we since COVID hit, we're seeing lower vaccination numbers all around. So lower vaccination of all, all different vaccines that we all need to get and children need to get. So we want people to understand that um, in in Kids are still susceptible to the same things. Uh, and so we need to make sure that kids, adults, especially our, our um, older populations in Marathon County, they need to get their flu shot in order to protect themselves. Uh, and then, you know, you can get your flu shot at the same time as getting your COVID shot, depending on where you go. So call your doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see if they can do both at the same time. And uh, is there any plans then for even maybe some pop-up walk-in clinics for flu vaccines here in Marathon County the same way you had, might have had with uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, you know, there are no immediate plans. I don't think we can rule it out yet, but uh, that's one of the things that I'm working on is we're going to be hiring a, a vaccine and testing coordinator. And so that's going to be something that if somebody is interested in, they can call me. Um, <laughs> they, can, they can look in the county. There's a jobs um, a job site on our, our website. Um, but I would love to have the opportunity for people to be able to get uh, the flu vaccine and COVID at the same time and just you know, two shots and then you're done. And then, uh, you know, two shots 
of, you know, depending on what kind you get, mm -hmm. <laughs> I should, I should right. qualify that. If you get Johnson and Johnson and you get the flu shot at the same time, then you're done. Um, but uh, remember that Pfizer and Moderna are a two shot series. So. Mm -hmm. And then maybe get a free small popcorn at the same time. And then you go in and, <laughs> and watch, uh, watch the new James Bond movie or, or something like that. You'll make it a fun event for people. That sounds great. You know, we've been, uh, we've been thinking about how to incentivize it for people. And, and my favorite story is from um, a local business who was trying to encourage their um, their uh, employees to get vaccinated. And so they, I was told that they gave their employees a cooler of meat. And, and that was like, okay, I've reached peak Wisconsin. Like that was, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Yeah, no, nobody, <laughs> nobody can turn that down. Nobody with a grill anyway can turn that down. <laughs> that sounds pretty amazing. Yes, indeed. And, and we'll look forward to seeing maybe some of the more of these ideas flowing as the, uh, as the season goes on. And, and maybe we can get uh, that vaccination rate up to, well, I believe it, what is it, the 75% mm -hmm. that we're shooting for? Yeah, we'd like to get it up there. You know, I, I, we have a little ways to go and we, know, we need more um, more parents to understand the benefits of vaccination, especially for age, uh, age 12 and up. Mm -hmm. So, and again, for, if they want information on that, they can just get a hold of you, correct? <laughs> yeah. Well, I would recommend <laughs> that they would get a hold of their primary care doctor. So you know, their mm -hmm. pediatrician and cause they, I think that that would probably make more sense to have somebody who they know and trust and has mm -hmm. been a part of their kid's health to give that information. All right. Well, we appreciate the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Good luck with the new position. And uh, we will hopefully, we will cross our fingers that uh, we can cross paths again and not talk about a pandemic. Correct? That would be fantastic. Yes. Well, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. Absolutely. Let's play Fortnite. Next <laughs> Why not? Hey, we'll, we, we can, can make that, we it. can make that happen. Yeah. <laughs>